Hello, thank you, thank you, welcome. I'm so glad to be here today. This is an important topic, this is an important panel. And we are really, really all in it together. Um, I would like to introduce myself, Caroline Mayer. I'm a lawyer. I am the founder and director of the Institute for Small Islands and Chief Empowerment Officer at the She Changes Climate organization and uh, an associate at Marin Company in Trinidad and Tobago Law Firm. Right now, we are in a deep crisis, planetary boundaries, climate crisis, war, the earth is under stress. This new international crime of ecocide, it is vital, it is vital that we get on board, it is vital that we protect the planet. If enough countries support it on a one state, one vote basis, ecocide can be added to the list of international crimes alongside genocide and crimes against humanity. This will act as a powerful break on harmful extractive practices and a much needed incentive for strategic change and innovation. If islands can be a powerful force for the protection of each other and indeed of all life on earth, we need to support them. Today, we have a wonderful range of speakers addressing this topic from the legal, diplomatic, scientific, and advocacy perspectives, who I will introduce before they each speak. To begin the conversation, we are delighted and honored to have opening remarks from our gracious state host, the Republic of Vanuatu, a leading voice on the global stage of groundbreaking legal approaches to climate and ecological crises, and the first to raise the issue of ecocide at the international criminal courts in 2019, and most recently at the UN. Speaking for Vanuatu today is His Excellency, Mr. Georges Manueri, ambassador at the Embassy of the Republic of Vanuatu in Brussels. Mr. Man Manueri has a significant and highly accomplished career as an experienced public official, having served at the highest level of Vanuatu's civil service for 17 years. He was a Director General of Ministry of Finance and Economic Management of Vanuatu prior to his current post, having held, previously held the same position at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and also at the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Tourism. Mr. Maniuri has played central roles in important developments for the country, including the revival of Vanuatu's foreign services and the establishment of diplomatic missions in strategic locations around the world. Your Excellency. We are hugely privileged to have you today with us. The floor is yours. Good evening or good morning to everybody. Good uh, evening, Caroline, to our distinguished uh, panelists and also our followers from across the world. It is indeed an honor for me on behalf of the Republic of Vanuatu to co-host alongside Stop Ecoside Foundation this session of island holding the world to account co-creating global legal responsibility under the 2022 Virtual Island Summit. It is Vanuatu's considered view that the matter of climate change remains the biggest challenge of our time and enhanced attention must be accorded to the matter. Addressing the issue necessarily requires a multi-pronged approach from setting obligations at national and international level holding states and private entities into account. We believe the preservation and protection of biodiversity and clean environment should be considered as rights and elevated to the same level as unknown rights, such as the right to self-determination as enshrined in the United Nations Charter, the other rights under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. It is noted that the current international legal framework penalizes to some extent breaches of standards and rights contained in those charters, convention and or treaties. However, the specific matter of deliberate destruction of biodiversity remains out of scope of the current international legal framework and in particular, the Rome Statute. The ongoing and flagrant worsening of exploitation, destruction of biodiversity can no longer be left without accountability. We acknowledge the, the 
stop foundation ecocide work to date, as well as the work undertaken by the eminent group of lawyers in coming up with a definition of the ecocide that is now making its way to where it should have been in the first place. Vanuatu will continue where and when possible to actively pursue and support genuine initiative contributing to advance this specific matter. We view this initiative as fully complementary to the current campaign seeking an advisory opinion from the International Legal Court of Justice, which we hope will gather the support of the of the of a vote and a vote of a majority of the membership of the United Nations General Assembly later this year. I'm, I'm very I'm very happy, uh, Caroline, to be uh, giving this introductory remark and the opportunity uh, to say those few remarks. And I thank you. I hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now. To give us an overall picture of this legal initiative and its recent progress, I'd like to introduce our first panel for today, our first panelist, Ms. Jojo Mehta. Ms. Mehta is co-founder and executive director of advocacy organization Stop Ecocide International and chair of the charitable Stop Ecocide Foundation, which supports in particular the participation of climate vulnerable states in the growing global conversation on ecocide. She has overseen the remarkable growth of the movement while coordinating legal developments, diplomatic traction, and public narrative. The organization now has teams or associate groups in over 40 countries. She was also the convener of the Independent Expert Panel for the Legal Definition of Ecocide. We are privileged to have an esteemed member of the drafting panel here today, Judge Tuiloma Neroni Slade, who we shall be hearing from shortly. But first, let us hear the broad strokes of why recognizing ecocide is important and what the latest developments are. Jojo Mehta. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we trust that today's discussion will be one that can spark some hope in a political landscape that is deeply challenging for island nations right now, nations which are bearing the brunt of climate and ecological breakdown that is not of their own making. And yet, as Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley so beautifully expressed in her opening speech for this summit at the beginning of the week, it is together in collaboration and in the spirit of protecting our shared world that we can implement transformative solutions. Ecocide law is, we believe, just such a solution and a powerful one. Ecocide is a word that is increasingly being used to refer to mass damage and destruction of the environment. Etymologically, it means, from the Greek and Latin, to kill one's home. And thus it feels like a very apt way to describe what is happening to the planet at the present time. The term was coined in 1970 to describe the awful damage created by the defoliant Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. And the word was first used on the diplomatic stage by Olaf Palmer, then Prime Minister of Sweden, in 1972 at the first UN conference on the human environment. Palmer called for severe environmental destruction, or ecocide, to be addressed at the international level. Fifty years later, it seems the world is at last taking this seriously, and discussion of criminalising ecocide is now on public record in at least 24 countries which are parties to the Rome Statute, the governing document of the International Criminal Court, or ICC. Right now, the ICC has jurisdiction over four international crimes, or crimes against peace as they are sometimes called. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the crime of aggression. And a growing body of people believe that ecocide should become the fifth crime on that list. Perhaps we should pause to imagine for a moment what world we might be living in today had ecocide been listed as a crime 20 years ago when the court opened its doors. Policy making and economic practice might have been very different and a lot less dangerous than they have become. A study at Colorado University a few years back examined the effect upon corporate behavior of changes in environmental law. And it found that when administrative regulation is strengthened, the result is a change in corporate budgeting. However, when a criminal law aspect is introduced, we actually see changes in behavior. Instead, what we can feel globally today at all levels, in my experience, is a deep and rising frustration with the lack of action which would actually be commensurate with the crisis we all face. 
and which island communities face more starkly than most. We humans are creatures of habit. We do not change easily or quickly, and the rate of change that we are experiencing collectively at this time is unprecedented. Our corporate and political decision makers now have skills and technologies at their command that have led the global community to an exceptional level of productivity and a small part of that community to a sophistication of lifestyle never imagined before. And it has come at great cost to people and planet. Earth's most vital ecosystems and keystone species, and thus humanity's ability to survive and thrive, are now at stake. It is time to recognize a truth that indigenous cultures have never forgotten, that when we damage Mother Earth, there are consequences. It's time for a crucial reality check. Criminalizing mass harm to nature or ecocide could make a powerful paradigm level difference. Because even if all emissions ceased tomorrow, if we continue denuding forests and polluting oceans, destroying key carbon sinks and vital ecosystems, we will continue to suffer from climate and ecological crisis. Ecocide law could address the destruction that is a root cause of ecological breakdown, holding government and corporate actors to account and acting as a protective safeguard and deterrent. But not only that, it could also act as a creative constraint, inspiring the urgent adaptive thinking we know is desperately needed. Because when we know what we must avoid, it becomes so much easier to work out and support the solutions we need. It levels the playing field for the adaptive and regenerative work which is already being done and which is currently an uphill struggle. And island nations, or rather great ocean states, have significant power to help this law come into existence. How so? Because the International Criminal Court is like the UN, a one state, one vote context where all states have an equal say, no matter their wealth or size. But unlike the UN, there is no security council, no veto. This means that the collective power of many states acting together is highly significant. The ICC also has a unique complementary mechanism, one that directly accesses the criminal justice systems of its member states. So any state ratifying a crime at the ICC may also enforce it at home. And a crime of ecocide at the International Criminal Court would not only strongly support the relevance of that court in relation to the most urgent challenge that humanity has ever faced, it would also strongly support those countries most at risk from climate and ecological disaster. So it should perhaps be no surprise that it was the Republic of Vanuatu which brought the subject of ecocide back to the diplomatic table in 2019 at the International Criminal Court's annual assembly, calling on states parties to the Rome Statute to seriously consider adding a crime of ecocide. Since then, developments have been remarkable and rapid around the globe. From parliamentary petitions, to government resolutions, to full proposals of law, the range of engagement is wide and varied, but we can say with confidence that this is a serious diplomatic conversation, which is now firmly in progress. Stop Ecoside International has been working for five years, developing global cross-sector support for this law, and I'd like to briefly highlight a few milestones that have taken place over the last year and a half. Firstly, the emergence of a consensus legal definition of Ecoside. There had been working definitions in the past, but these were always the legal opinion of one or a small local group of interested lawyers. However, in 2020, our charitable foundation was approached by Swedish politicians, asking whether we could convene a drafting project for a practical consensus definition of ecocide as an international crime, one that they could reasonably present to their government for consideration. And this in turn enabled us to bring together top legal minds from around the world to complete this task. The resulting definition is remarkably concise and balanced. Indeed, the core text fits on the back of a business card, always useful when dealing with politicians who are usually far too busy to read a 20 page document. And I'll just briefly share the core definition now. So here it is, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. It's straightforward legal language that states are familiar with. It has inbuilt flexibility while addressing threats of the worst harms, and it has clearly resonated well, both in the media and in politics. In the short time since its launch in June last year, 
It has become widely supported and a strong basis for international diplomatic discussions, as well as national and regional ones, for example, in Belgium and the EU. You will shortly be hearing more about the definition and its implications from Judge Tuilema Naroni Slade, one of the esteemed panel of experts which drafted it. The second milestone was the presentation of the definition to the Assembly of States Parties at the ICC last December, which was officially supported by three of the world's most climate vulnerable states, Vanuatu, Samoa and Bangladesh. And for the first time, a head of state endorsed the initiative in a special message for the occasion, the Right Honourable Fiamme Naomi Mataafa of Samoa. And Belgium also intervened to express international support as well as progress towards a potential domestic adoption of ecocide law. And in July of this year, when the ICC held to mark its 20th anniversary, a one-day conference on the past, present and future of the court, a significant proportion of the future section was dedicated to ecocide. Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, Inga Anderson, recently declared that she has observed this word ecocide floating to the top and that she expects it to walk its way into the UN vocabulary. And indeed, UNEP's Law Director, Patricia Caberium-Bote, will be moderating a panel on ecocide at the upcoming COP27 talks in Egypt. And in the very latest news, the ecocide discussion reached the UN General Assembly just last week in New York, with Vanuatu's President Furo Buravu calling for its consideration alongside other legal avenues, as described by Ambassador Manuri. Simultaneously, the Pivot Point report, launched by the Race to Zero Climate Champions, included a significant section on ecocide law as a key driver towards net zero. Businesses around the world have already begun to sign an open letter to governments calling for this law. And I believe the link will be put in the chat. So as you can hear, this is a conversation that is only set to grow louder and not a moment too soon. If we are to make it together through the coming decades, we must set healthy legal parameters that are truly adequate to protect nature, the climate, and our common future. Indeed, that future very likely depends upon us doing so. And by working together, this protective law of ecocide can and should be put in place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jojo. It is indeed time for a reality check. I can tell you we are seeing this destabilization of the environment right now in the Caribbean. Um, it's Florida, it's just battered. Cuba with its aging and crumbling infrastructure was also underwater and without power just before. These are lives, this is our reality, the islands. And now we will hear a bit more about the work to legally, de to legally define ecocide from one of the Pacific's most respected and distinguished legal and diplomatic voices, Judge Tuiluma Neroni Slade. Judge Slade served two terms as Secretary General to the Pacific Islands Forum, 2008 to 2014, following an already distinguished career, having been elected to the International Criminal Court for, in 2003, for a three-year term as presiding judge of the pre-trial Chamber Two at The Hague. He has, thus been, he has thus had direct experience of the institution, most relevant to this experience. He has previously served the independent state of Samoa as ambassador to the UN, ambassador to the USA, and high commissioner to Canada, as well as spending a number, year, number of years as attorney general. Judge Slade, we'd be honored if you could tell us more about the importance of the legal consensus definition you, you helped draft, and in particular why it and the recognition of ecocide are significant for the Pacific region. Thank you, the floor is yours. Um, Madam moderator, you have been most kind and I thank you for your words of introduction. Um, uh, this uh, session is billed um, as an island summit and uh, I should like, if I may, um, uh, to start with a, a contribution <clears throat> of an island uh, perspective. Um, as we all know, uh, smallness, geography, environmental fragility, and uh, the general state of vulnerability of island communities <clears throat> have combined as key determinants in the international policy and positions of small island communities. Uh, the global environment, 
international peace and human security and the ocean and its resources in particular have become areas of major policy concentration. The oceans is quite simply fundamental to are the real prospects for development and for a viable a future are available to small island countries. Ironically, as we all know, it is now the ocean and the global climate forces that present the most serious threat to sustainability. Threat indeed to existence, especially in the low lying island countries like the Bahamas, the Maldives and Tuvalu. Some 40 island countries are members of the United Nations. Their modern history and development closely associated with the United Nations Charter principles, including the reaffirmation of equal rights of nations large and small and respect for international law. Fragility has determined the need for togetherness. And these are countries which are detailed and sophisticated in their development of concepts and the practice of regional partnership and arrangements, whether in the Caribbean and their CARICOM arrangements, the Indian Ocean and their commission, or in the Pacific and the Forum Island uh, leaders uh, gathering. And so it is also for the islands in the Atlantic. Collectively at the international level, small island states are significant in the influence and the potency of their policy and advocacy. And we all know the immensely important role that the alliance of small island states have undertaken and continue to play in the affairs of the world. We all know of the conscientious and effective participation of our island communities in the international debate on the oceans, the climate change and the bio system, uh, biodiversity systems of the world. From whichever part of the world, island countries and their citizens take seriously the need not only to give voice to their concerns, but to engage in setting global policy and to undertake their fair share, their fair share in the international judiciary and the international uh, bureaucracy of the, of the global systems, whether in global peacekeeping, safe, the safeguard against nuclear weapons, the protection of the oceans and its vital resources, or the struggle against the impacts of global climate change. More than often, these are communities who bring to the policy table an essential ethical dimension. Their voice is that of people in imminent danger. Danger in the face of extensive and prolonged testing of nuclear weapons for over 50 years from 1946 by three different colonial governments at over 10 different sites across the Pacific. And danger of ever frightening destruction of the climate change impacts worldwide. It was the same island voice by which Trinidad and Tobago in 1989, before the United Nations General Assembly, had launched its initiative against the horrendous crime of illicit trafficking in narcotic drugs across national frontiers, and which had sparked off with the international community the establishment of the International Criminal Court that we know today. And so, Madam Moderator, as to the topic assigned to me and the importance of the ecocide definition and its significance to Pacific and to other island communities, I would recall that some 20 years ago, 
the international community, horrified by the atrocities of countless conflicts around the world, had gathered in Rome to seek protection for all, protection for all, and by the common bonds of humanity to fashion something better for our world. The International Criminal Court was a result. I think a creation at a critical moment in history. I also think the Rome Statute is a visionary step. The court exists today for the prevention of international crimes and for the enf enforcement of international justice. Grave crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, for they threaten not simply peace, but also the security and the well-being of the world. And there is solemn determination to prevent such crimes and to put an end to impunity for the perpetrators. By their membership, 124 nations of the world, including my own island country, Samoa, have pledged unwavering faith and commitment to the purpose and the principles of the Rome Statute. And their support of the essential role the court plays as part of the international rules-based order. For small states in particular, given their smallness and the, and the vulnerabilities which I have referred to, there is really little other option. Ultimately, it is the global order and the rule of law which provide the most effective protection. Island communities are now bearing the brunt of the consequences of environment damage worldwide. They have next to negligible responsibility in the causes, and yet our communities are suffering disproportionately. We know the problems. We know the major emissions, where they come from. But we also know that there is little that we, the island communities, could do with these massive legal responsibilities if the nations that are responsible are silent to, their, uh, to our appeals and fail in their political commitment and moral responsibility to act. Now, the esteemed Kofi Annan as United Nations Secretary General at the time had described the creation of the Rome Statute as the event when good people spoke up on behalf of innocent victims. Innocent victims of horrendous crime and in the in name of international law. Well now, when we look around our world today, there are even more innocent victims, in particular victims of unlawful or wanton and excessive acts causing severe and either widespread or long-term damage to global biodiversity and the environment, and the dangers we see daily affecting the global climate system. There is a huge climate system going right through the Caribbean and the Americans right now. My own view is that there is substantial, substantive and rightful cause for international demand for ecocidal and gross environmental acts to be carefully examined in terms of the structure and the principles of the Rome Statute. I do think the historic moment has come to give the matter early and the fullest attention. There are, of course, counter and competing viewpoints, and these are to be respected. On the other hand, the scientific evidence and the authoritative assessments by the International Panel on Climate Change, by UNEP, and so many others are out there in abundance and have been so for a very long time and already overwhelming in their urgency and the need for serious global responses. I believe that the in ecocide we wish to see 
as the fifth international crime is such a response. <clears throat> as framed by the international panel, ecocide would need to be a true ICC crime in line with the Rome Statute and harnessing the power of international law for the protection of our shared global environment. There is need also to allow for the fact that none of the existing international law provisions protect the environment as an end for itself. I believe that new thinking and perspectives are called for because the science is just beyond clarity and the evidence of damage is established and widespread gross and wanton environmental damage to our globe uh, to our climate system and globally essential and life-sustaining environmental stocks in your country and region and in my country and the Pacific region. We need ecocide. We, the island communities especially, are severely affected. I invite you all to, jo to join the initiative of the Ecocide Foundation and give it every support. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, thank you, Judge Slade. I just want to also thank you for your, your reference to the immensely important impact of the Alliance of Small Island States and the role of my island, Trinidad and Tobago in the creation of the International Criminal Court. And I just wanted to echo a line of yours that was just so incredibly beautiful. Fragility has forged the need for togetherness. It's so true. And it's beyond islands right now. It's the whole world. We are in a very fragile state. We now turn to the scientific and field-based work of one of the Caribbean's most eminent academic voices on marine biology and conservation, Professor Judith Gobin. Professor Gobin is head of the Department of Life, Science in Life Sciences in the, in the Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And she is a marine biologist with more than 40 years experience in a variety of marine environments and has published significant contributions to the field on new marine scientific records and new marine species. As a SID scientist, she has been participating in the ongoing UN negotiations for a legally binding instrument on areas or biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, ABNJ or BBNG. Professor Gobin continues to inspire young scientists and especially young girls and women. Professor, we would love to hear your perspective and experience regarding threatened marine environments and how legal instruments, including ecocide law, can help in the urgent task of protecting them. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you sincerely, moderator, uh, excellencies, all guests, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Sincere thanks to the Stop Ecocide Foundation and the Republic of Vanuatu for the opportunity to contribute to this very important conversation. Small island developing states and the PSIDs are especially vulnerable. We've just heard from Judge Slade and I'm really glad coming just after him. He talked about, he reminded us, it's our small land masses, it's our isolation, susceptibility to natural disasters and exactly that, our ecological fragility. As island peoples, our lives are inextricably linked to the sea, for the marine resources, including fisheries, recreation, tourism, maritime travel, etc. As for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean and the Pacific Sids, which of, of course includes Vanuatu, we are more appropriately recognized, as Jojo has said, as big ocean states. That is, we have a much larger ocean to land mass. It is clear then that we have most to lose from degradation of these very marine resources. We need to think about our natural resources as a component of our natural capital. It is these very assets that provide us with free goods and services, ecosystem services, which we know about. And it is this that actually underpins our economy and society and makes life for all of us possible on islands. Therefore, it is only natural that all natural capital explorers, refiners and developers 
at local, regional, or an international level must have an obligation to adhere to environmental regulations. Key to appreciating threats of marine resources is recognizing that the, that the interconnectivity of oceans is what in fact exacerbates the vulnerability. Unlike the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. On the contrary, environmental impacts from very far away countries do affect us. A few examples that I want to talk about, global carbon emissions, global elevated temperatures, and Judge Slade alluded to it, climate change. We are living, we are feeling the effects of this. Excessive rainfall, severe weather, more hurricanes, carbon dioxide at increased levels dissolving into the ocean, making it more acidic, and the warmer temperatures, a combination of things. The marine ecosystem's ability to continue producing those resources that we thrive on, it, uh, the resilience and the very regulating functions are all affected by these inputs. For example, the coral reefs in our twin island, um, state in our island, Tobago, off of Tobago, um, Trinidad and Tobago, continue to be affected by global climate change impacts and are presently declining in health. By virtue of the reefs being there, they provide shoreline protection services by reducing erosion and wave damage at a value that has been calculated to be between US 18 and $33 million per year. We know, as Judge Slade remarked, who the largest global CO2 carbon dioxide emitters are. Whom should we then hold accountable? How can SIDS be compensated? Who will finance mitigation or adaptation in small island territories to the impacts of climate change? Admittedly, within our own territories and at a national level, we are also reaping the benefits of a plethora of our own land-based activities and impacts. We face the cumulative impacts of pollution, agricultural plastics, hydrocarbons, nutrients, pesticides. At the same time, Flooding continues with unmanaged hillside development and development without adherence to laws uh, proceed at a pace. These impacts are compounded by global climate change impacts as well. We must act now to limit the risks to the environment and including the quality of life for all citizens. Let's have a look at the second example, the plague of the golden plague as it's known as the Sargassum plague. The obvious interconnectivity of oceans and water bodies means the interconnectivity of critical fauna and vulnerable ecosystems. Extensive maps of sargassum since around 2011 have been causing reduced access to fishing grounds, beach fouling, and death to marine life in the Caribbean and in other territories. The origin appears to be in waters, or rather from waters, near the North Equatorial Recirculation Region, an area which is influenced by nutrients from the Amazon and Congo rivers. And in addition, there's equatorial upwelling. Caribbean SIDS have suffered severe economic losses. Who is to be held accountable for this? Who takes responsibility for this widespread expanse of sagassum and the associated damage, the loss of livelihoods, the negative impacts on tourism and so on. As a third example, let's look at the leatherback turtle, Democles coriacea. It's an ancient, a very elegant mariner swimming from faraway countries such as Africa, Canada, and the UK. Trinidad and Tobago, we are very um, proud to have the third largest nesting population in the world. But the species, they are vulnerable. Their greatest threat worldwide is the commercial fishing industry, that is the long lining and drift netting um, industries. They are, the leatherback turtles are particularly susceptible to ocean pollution. That is, they mistake plastic bags for their favorite food, which are jellyfish, when they're swimming in the open oceans. Who takes responsibility for such extensive damage from industrial fishing, which are mainly carried out by developing countries? 
who takes responsibility for the extensive volume of plastics discarded in the ocean and that come to our shores and that in effect affects the turtles on their maritime journey. How do we in Trinidad and Tobago as a SIDS territory, how do we continue to ensure survival of these vulnerable leatherback turtles? As a fourth and final example, deep sea biodiversity is threatened globally. The deep sea is home to a rich biodiversity and is the last frontier being considered for development. Deep sea mining will destroy. Picture a bulldozer plowing through the seafloor, wreaking destruction, including pollution, destroying organisms that took millions of years to grow, and many of which are as yet undiscovered, undocumented, and, new to, and perhaps new to science. We cannot destroy our biodiversity and these potential resources, which include marine genetic resources that already provide us with key pharmaceuticals, including cancer drugs, cancer drugs, cosmetics, and, and other related products. The Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, of which I am a member, DOSI, stands ready to assist the International Seabed Authority in this regard. Even as the knowledge of the deep sea is evolving, we still need the science, and even as we are in dire need of funding and marine technical training and capacity building. I am pleased to say that as we speak, there is an active declaration call for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. Many SIDS, including some CARICOM territories, including Trinidad and Tobago and the Pacific, including the Republic of Vanuatu, have signed on. While my legal colleagues are contemplating the various legal considerations associated with stopping ecocide, the science must inform and determine the various thresholds, as we've just heard from Judge Slade, harmful effects, significant adverse change, serious harm, substantive and widespread, and of course, how do we determine long-term impacts and so on. Notwithstanding that, we must apply the precautionary principle, which is of, in itself core to the international environmental law, and we must say no to deep sea mining. Ladies and gentlemen, the negative impacts of global environmental activities do reach far removed territories such as our islands. Most of these are often associated with high level investments and policy division, decisions rather for nations. In other words, they are not often created by ordinary citizens. There must be accountability at all levels, that is at a citizen level, at the national level, regionally, and of course, global governments must account. SIDS do have a real collective power and can contribute to curbing destructive practices that exacerbate environmental damage and destruction, including climate change. We have already had loud voices to be reckoned with at the recent fifth IGC meeting on the very UN negotiations on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction that was just mentioned by Caroline. The interconnectivity of the oceans demands better stewardship to ensure good human health and well-being and social equity for ourselves and future generations. As a SIDS CARICOM scientist, I therefore join with this esteemed panel and endorse the global call, Stop Ecocide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Yes, what happens in Vegas usually slips downstream to the ones of the Caribbean. <laughs> the science must inform and decide various thresholds. These are just important. We have to listen to the scientists. We have to listen to the scientists. I'm now delighted and honored to introduce our final intervention for today, which comes from His Excellency Sir Ronald Sanders, Ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda to the United States and also to the Organization of American States. A highly distinguished diplomat, Sir Ronald Sanders, is also High Commissioner to, to Canada since 2017. He has served twice as Antigua's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, as well as ambas Ambassador and Negotiator to the World Trade Center Organization. He was a rapporteur at the, of the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group in 2010 to 2011, whose seminal report entitled A Commonwealth of the People, Time for Urgent Reform, Laid, a plan, laid out a plan of action to make the Commonwealth effective and relevant 
something that is no doubt at the forefront of many minds following the passing of Queen Elizabeth. So Ronald, when the legal definition emerged last year, you were strongly and publicly supportive of it. And it appears your response has been vindicated since we can see that in, in a little over a year, this consensus definition has already become the de facto starting point for diplomatic discussions on ecocide. Can you tell us about the potential you saw in this initiative and why it must be engaged with and supported across our island nations and communities? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> there's no doubt in the minds of the people of my small island state, Antigua and Barbuda, that small island states and countries with low-lying coasts are the victims of ecocide. That is why when the draft law was unveiled last year, I immediately endorsed it. The draft law defined ecocide, as we heard earlier, as, and I'll repeat it because it's worth, uh, it's worth hearing the definition again, unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Given all that has occurred in the last year in every region of the world, who could legitimately suggest that ecocide should not be a criminal offense actionable by the International Criminal Court? This last summer has been a summer of disasters in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and in North America. Thousands of people have been killed, and destruction has been so intense and so widespread that its disastrous effects will last for years. In the United States, the images today on television across the world of devastation and decimation in Florida being wreaked by Hurricane Ian, moving to South Carolina and Atlanta, are ample testimony of the damaging impact of climate change caused by wanton greenhouse gas emissions. A few days ago, the wreckage caused by Hurricane Fiona in Canada, particularly in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, were shocking to Canadians. But the scale of that devastation is not new to countries in the Caribbean, where today Cuba and Puerto Rico are experiencing countrywide electricity outages. We in the Caribbean, as in the Pacific, know the devastation of extreme weather events very well. We suffer them every year with the persistence and increased frequency and intensity with which they come. They take our lives and they wreck our livelihoods. When climate change is not, while climate change is not specifically mentioned in the draft law on ecocide, supporting that draft law and joining in its enactment would send a serious message to states and entities that do little or nothing to stop ecolo ecological damage to vulnerable countries. But small islands would like to see ecocide broadened to include the impact of climate change, which the draft law does not now do. We suffer loss and damage year after year, for which we are not compensated by the world's greatest polluters. And I remind you that small island states collectively do not contribute even 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This is why Antigua and Barbuda supports the initiative by Vanuatu at the UN General Assembly to seek approval for an opinion by the International Court of Justice on the rights of present and future generations to be protected from the impacts of climate change. It is also why Antigua and Barbuda, along with Tuvalu, Palau, and Nui, have established a UN registered commission of small island states on climate change and international law. The objective of this commission is to seek an advisory opinion directly from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea 
on compensation for persistent loss and damage caused by climate change. The Vanuatu Initiative and the commission established by my country and three other small island states reflects our joint frustration with the failures of the COP process to address the damage being done to our countries. Something has to give in this on-level playing field in which small island states and low-lying coastal states are made to suffer. The peoples and governments of small island states cannot sit back while their countries are destroyed and they themselves are dislocated from their homelands. Therefore, the initiative for a new international criminal law called ecocide is very welcome. Even if at this stage, including climate change in the definition of ecocide is not possible, the opportunity should be grasped to make it attainable in the future. The perpetrators who are now getting a free pass should see that the victims are serious about recompense for damage. Small island states such as mine welcome the efforts of the Stop Ecocide Foundation. We know that unless meaningful action is taken, there will be no ancestral homeland for our future generations. And our civilization will quite literally be submerged. That none of us can allow to happen. And that we must resist. It calls for all small, island, all small island states to act together and to act now. The international legal order has been weakened under the threat by Russia's aggression in the Ukraine. The paralysis of the UN Security Council has been exposed. Nonetheless, we cannot allow international law to be discarded and ignored. International law and respect for it are our swords and our shields. Therefore, we are obliged in our own interest to stand firm for the inclusion of ecocide among the crimes that the ICC should consider. All small states should join the effort to amend the Rome Statute to give the ICC that necessary power. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Collectively, small islands do not contribute even 1% to greenhouse gases. This is something we know, but when we take into account the failure of the COP process to address loss and damage and compensation for persistent loss and damage, it is truly terrible. Thank you, Sir Ronald Sanders, for highlighting this and for reminding us that all small island states must act together and act now. And this ties back to the beautiful line, fragility has forged the need for togetherness. I would like to thank you, panelists, speakers, for your wonderful presentation, your wonderful comment contributions. And I invite any comments, any follow-up points from other panelists right now. I'll relinquish the floor. Hi, um, I'd love to thank, obviously thank Caroline for her, her moderation and all the panelists for their contributions. And I think that of, of all the events that I've contributed to around this subject, this context of the Virtual Island Summit is where the, the, the need and the, the urgency of this work is really coming into stark relief. And, and I think that was beautifully summed up by Sir Ronald just now in his in his presentation. This is is some this is a this is an initiative that it feels long, long, long overdue. And, and we can really feel that, I think, in the context of what the island nations are suffering. Um, and I think also that this is about not just um, putting in place the outer boundaries of, you know, where we know we must not go, we must no longer go. I mean, if we're going to move into a world that is livable for, for ourselves, for our children, 
we are going to have to have in place some kind of framework like this that will prevent the worst harms from happening and that will actually you know reflect the need for harmony with the world around us and and begin to sort of shift that mindset that has led to the sort of globally dominant dominant paradigm that we have now where we are so alienated from the natural living world that we somehow consider it a bank of resources that we can just continue to plunder um and and this is this is simply you know it's it's not it's not feasible it doesn't reflect the truth it doesn't reflect the science and you know ironically it's actually often the voices of the spiritual communities who are pointing this out in indigenous spokespeople for example you know who totally understand this reciprocal relationship that we have with the planet um and it's ironic that the secular that many of our secular leaders globally seem to be operating on a, a kind of faith uh, in an economic system which is quite clearly dysfunctional um and, and and it has has that extractive quality to it that is 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 causing so much damage in places that are, are not are not at fault so i would i i just love to sort of thank everybody around um everybody in the panel and, and everything that they have said around this but i would also just like to throw into the mix before we dive in, in into questions or before other comments from the other panelists um that actually this this is not just um a limitation or if you take that kind of um well-known metaphor of the stick and the carrot your criminal law is often seen as the stick and and and, and rightly so in many ways um but it's also it's also you know criminal law is there for, is there to protect you know we, we have a basic human right to life but that right is protected by the fact that to kill each other is criminal um, and so criminal law it, it is protective law, but it's also has this potential to stimulate movement in the right direction. There seems to be such a kind of inertia at the political level and at the industrial level around actually acting in a way that is up to the level that is needed in the current crisis. You know, we see people sort of switching to sort of recyclable materials or, or, or you know, sort of reducing their emissions a bit here and there. It's, it's all sort of tinkering and playing the same game a little bit better. But in order if we want people to play a different game, to play differently, we actually need to change the rules. And that is where this, this um, initiative really finds its home. Because when we have those that framework, it actually enables us to move in a new direction. And what we found, it's very interesting, what we found when we speak to people in, in business and industry, and you know, we show them this, this definition, those who are experts in their sector immediately start viewing that sector through the lens of the definition and, and asking the questions that are desperately needing to be asked. In other words, you know, what do I need to think about in my sector if this is a law that is coming into place and we're already hearing from even quite conservative politicians we know this is coming we just don't know exactly when but when we start asking the right questions i have great faith in 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 the human imagination in this way you know when we start asking the right questions that's when we start finding the answers and so having a framework that actually stimulates those questions is is another really important aspect of this global conversation. And I'll, I'll leave it there for now and, and look forward to other, other comments and questions. Thank you. I would like to invite the panelists to open their uh, cameras and their mics, and please feel free to, to chat, to discuss anything right now. Um, we have, how much time do we have, Christian? How are we going? Well, can I just say that I don't have very much time left, so I'm, uh, I will express my thanks to everybody for uh, the honor of participating in this discussion. It's been great to see old friends and uh, to see new faces here. Uh, this was a very impressive discussion all around. I would just end by uh, saying what I, uh, in summary, what I said before. This is not a moment for hesitation. Uh, this is not a moment for dithering. Uh, ecocide is real and action on it is absolutely necessary. And I would very much like to see a part of what ecocide becomes if it ever gets into the uh, 
purview of the International Criminal Court, climate change. Climate change is our ever-present danger, and it is now real. So I thank you all very much, and I will take my leave. But thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity to participate. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ronald Sanders, and thank you for your excellent contribution. We are so grateful to have you. Thank you. Professor Gobert, do you have any comments? Oh, yes, yes. thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much. And of course, um, speaking just for eight minutes, there's always um, much more than one would like to say. Um, but, um, you know, so clearly we do, there's lots more issues that we could have, I could, we could have brought to the fore. But I think um, it's, it, I think it is very clear that small islands, we are, we really are bearing the brunt of it. Um, you know, what's happening elsewhere, it comes to us. Um, and, and we know that, um, you know, just in with circulation of water, um, the global warming, the all of the impacts, um, it may, it's not necessarily what we ourselves are doing. Having said that, we also contribute to it. We, we need to be aware of that. But at the same time, I think it's important that we start having accountability. And um, this is why I'm, I think it's coming at the right time. Um, we must really forge with it. Um, there's no time for dithering, as um, the ambassador said. We really must act now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I judge. I, I invite uh, Ambassador George, Judge Slade. Any any comments or questions? We have twenty seven minutes actually, so we have a lot of time for contrib uh, contributions and questions. And I'll go into the questions from the. Um, from the chat as well in a little bit. Uh, Madam uh, moderator, have I, got, have I got the floor? Yes, you do, all right. please. All right, well, first of all, um, I think one can safely say that uh, the, the science is clear and what is more, uh, and and coming, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have heard um, uh, Professor Gobin, because obviously we amongst the island communities understand our oceans and we know a great deal about the ocean and the forces uh, that are playing in the oceans. That we cannot have the present disturbance in the climate uh, 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 system without the extraordinary forcing influence of the ocean. So these are very highly interconnected natural systems. And there's massive, massive pollution of our oceans. They are, we are ocean dwellers, you and me. We live, that is our natural environment. And we understand the science is beyond doubt. But the reality of our day, as we talk about possible revisions and additions to the International Criminal Law Statute, the reality is others, the policy makers, the politicians, they make these decisions. To some extent, we, the officials, we, the technical people, have done our work. We've come up with the definition we now need to take it to a different level where the polishes, uh, politicians and the political system has to consider and to deal with it. I do not believe it is to our advantage uh, for that stage to be reached until and when our politicians have been prof properly Prepared, being prepared for the necessary discourse at the political level. I hope I'm wrong, but I hope they are already prepared and ready to undertake that very critical discussion amongst politicians and the establishment of policy at that level about what we're saying, what we're suggesting, what the panel has, has defined. I do not believe that the panel has any illusion about the total perfection of its definition. 
but it's it's a legitimate and a conscientious and uh, and a, a, a legally con considered offering from the panel. But it's for others to undertake. It's good to hear Sir Ronald, uh, one of the greatest uh, of your Caribbean orators, would let him take his persuasion a bit further and persuade not you and me, but persuade the political policy makers. Let him work a little bit harder. <laughs> we need that conversation because I believe we're talking amongst the converts. So let those who make these political decisions be converted and to be properly informed. Make Jojo work harder because she understands the insights <laughs> and the technical aspects because she has cohabited in her extremely busy life uh, with all the experts who will want to do this, who will want to shift a word, who will want to do more with the definition. Jojo is one of the people that I absolutely support and believe in. But I do, but when she says, but I do worry when she says, we want to change the rules. Be careful about that. And my view is we are not changing the rules because much of what we're trying to do in Ecoside is already in the spirit and in the fundamentalism of the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute is about international justice for all. The Rome Statute is a mirror reflection of the principles of the United Nations Charter, a charter that has drawn by we, the people, by you and me. We are not changing the rules necessarily. We are projecting a historical moment and viewpoint onto foundations that have been set a long time ago. We cannot deny damage to our environment. The environment that breathes you and me life as it breathes to everybody else. We are not creating and we're not changing the rules. We are enlightening the rules. Forgive me, Jojo, but I think it's an important point. Not Thanks. at all. I think this is actually very important. And it, what, what you're bringing back to mind, actually, is, is one of the discussions that um, came up in the during the drafting process, which is that it's actually um, that the Rome statute crimes, what they do is they take um, sort of acts that are already effectively condemned and they raise them to the level of an international crime. Um, and I think that there was a real kind of consciousness around that. And that is why the language, in fact, that was used, it does echo and, and draws from previous law, you know, from the Environmental Modification Convention, from the Geneva Protocols, and from other parts of the Rome Statute itself. So in fact, um, Judge Slade, you're quite right, there's, there's actually nothing new, really, in this in this no. definition. Um, what it what it's bringing to what it's bringing to the, you know, to, to, to mind is that these principles should also apply when we are dealing with damage to the environment. Sure. There is nothing about climate change in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And yet, we need to deal with the Law of the Sea. And we are dealing with the Law of the Sea in the framework of UNCLOS. Because it's a reality not to deal with the effects of climate change the natural and scientific interaction and forcing influences of ocean and atmosphere is an unrealistic way to interpret UNCLOS. So, and much of what we're talking about, about the environment was, was, was discussed in the making of the Rome Statute at the conference in Rome. We did not, all the island communities did not um, could not press their environmental concerns 
about nuclear damage, about these things, because there was no consensus in Rome. So in my view, and I've said it before, ecos with ecocide, we are dealing with an unfinished business of Rome. The Rome Statute under sec uh, Section 8 of the Rome Statute actually deals uh, with un environmental concerns, but it does so in the confines of war. Well, we don't want to fight a war in order for the environment to be dealt with under the international criminal law, do we? So this is, it, it's, it, it's, it's in, well, I've said what I've said. But thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. And if there are no more comments from the panelists, I'm going to open up the floor for the questions. Uh, so there's a very good question here, very precise question. Is it too early to start considering a target defendant country to attempt to establish judicial recognition of ecocide? That is to the point. My goodness. Do we even want to address that right now? <laughs> well, I mean, the, I think the first thing to say to that is that the, this, the ICC crimes are aimed at individuals, not at states. Um, and so, you know, if you were going to identify a defendant, you would have to choose a person, um, not a country. Um, and certainly there have been, there have already been filings made at the ICC um, which actually refer to crimes against humanity, but which mention conceptually that, um, you know, ecocide is, is relevant and, and those particular filings uh, relate to Brazil. Um, but I think the what's also interesting in this whole arena is that there are also nation states which are looking at uh, including ecocide in their domestic legislation. Um, and for example, it's, it's worth mentioning Belgium here, which is at the, the forefront of this discussion because um, they had a vote just before the end of last year where a large majority um, voted in favor of the government legislating for ecocide, both nationally and supporting the international uh, initiative. And what I think is, is, is a good testimony to the even handedness and clarity of the definition that emerged from the panel on which Judge Slade sat is that the expert group appointed in Belgium to consider whether it, was, it is appropriate to add ecocide to the Belgium criminal code um, came back with a positive response. And not only that, they actually came back with a suggested definition that's very close indeed to um, to that of the, the consensus definition from the drafting panel last year. Um, we also know that the European Law Institute, which has been working over the last year or two, in fact, on an, on an, on an ecocide project um, in relation to the EU specifically, has also been basing its core draft on the draft on the definition that uh, that came out of the international drafting panel so i think i think uh, both sort of at a regional level and at a domestic level um there is you know an acknowledgement that um you know that this has been a, a useful starting point um for for those um situations and i think that um but i also think it's worth mentioning that um we don't have to wait for the law to be adopted for it to already be having an effect um and i would say and this sort of responds a little bit to um what judge slade was talking about in terms of the advocacy side and moving forward at the political level um what we've discovered is that politicians are always come to the party last when they know everyone else is already there having a good time um you know effectively they then they're never sort of first movers on these initiatives <laughs> Um, and so, you know, we've sort of rather deliberately, in a sense, taken this strategic approach of very sort of rather organically, but but very broad spectrum advocacy, because what that means is that when when politicians can't avoid the conversation, because it's coming up all over the place, you know, it's coming from NGOs, it's coming from grassroots mobilizations, it's now starting to come also from the corporate world, interestingly. Um, because investors in particular are wanting to stabilize the, the, the risk around things that they're investing in, as, as well as 
to be honest, looking out into the world and saying this is a really serious situation and we need some serious uh, responses to it. So I think at this point, um, a lot of this is actually about, and this also speaks to one of the questions that popped up in the Q&A as well, around, you know, how do we sort of assist this moving forward? And, and one of the key aspects of that is quite simply uh, spread the conversation is actually is have the conversation is talk about ecocide because once that word becomes difficult to avoid and I think we're already starting to reach that point then you know politicians really have to engage um, and and there is something about the the word that has a kind of a an internal momentum um, I mean there are some brilliant um, uh, treaties under discussion um, for example the 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 um, legally binding treaty on on uh, tr transnational corporations and, and, and human rights and so on and and, and yet that's you know that they, they've got sort of long weighty titles that you know perhaps an, an average person can't grasp but the concept of of ecocide is really quite straightforward and and sometimes we even get asked you know how how can you how can you put ecocide alongside genocide you know is it you know is in genocide the most um horrific crime um on on the planet and and i suppose one at that point one has to sort of separate the uh the intent from the consequence because i think as far as the intent uh of um requirement for genocide it, it is absolutely um a, a, a crime of, of great evil um there has to be an intent to destroy a people in whole or in part um with ecocide of course we we're not looking at that same situation because very few people set out on purpose to destroy the environment. They set out to make money or to, you know, farm beef or to industrially fish or to, you know, mine for minerals, etc. And the, the, the sort of devastating side effects are the the collateral damage is is ecocide and is, of course, the lives and livelihoods of, of, of vulnerable peoples and countries around the world. And so it's when we look at the consequences of those of those actions that we see why it belongs at the international level and i think this also comes back to the the, the real simplicity of, of this definition because effectively rather than sort of listing a series of acts that ought to be prohibited um what it focuses on is the threat of a certain level of harm and that actually creates a, a sort of a I suppose a sort of dynamism or a sort of future proofing almost um, because, you know, we can't know. And, and I think deep sea mining, as, as Professor uh, Gobin brought up, is a, is a very uh, clear example of this. Um, that, you know, we can't know from one year to the next what sort of devastating practices are going to be dreamed up. Um, and so having, you know, a definition that can capture a, a certain level of harm, a level of threatened harm is is really important and and i must apologize i've now rambled around three or four of the questions in the in the chat and, and... Um, could i just add to that please caroline do, can i just add yeah so just very quickly um jojo thank you and i think you know one of the things that i i thought of when you were speaking is that um while they may not set out to purposely harm the environment the thing is there's a lot of um ignorance meaning and simply meaning we're not, we, and we are still learning as scientists as well. We don't know enough. And most people, the investors, the business people, they don't know enough. But I think now that science is providing a lot of the answers, then it means they don't have an, an, an excuse for, I didn't know, and I didn't know. And, th and that's why I thought I would talk about the interconnectivity, because, you know, whatever you do, you know, a million, hundred miles away, um, thousands of miles away, it does come back to haunt some of us and including yourself. So I think to, that, that that's gonna be really an excuse from now on that we didn't know because we have been making these connections now. Thanks. Okay, Caroline, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, there was a very good question about deep sea mining, but, um, and that was from Janine Everett. Um, but I think that we've already, touched on that. So I'm going to go to the next question. How do we best connect to the people? Sorry, do you know what? I'm just going to read it from here. I think it's from Benjamin Hamilton. Here we go. How do we best connect the people of the world to the biosphere and the need to put Earth first? Every human has a responsibility 
to feel connected to Mother Earth as do Indigenous peoples. Every human has responsibility to feel connected to Mother Earth as do Indigenous peoples. So I, I think they're asking how do we connect people to the Earth and, 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 and maybe touching on the ethos and the spirituality and the um, in intellectual and scientific knowledge of the Indigenous peoples connect to this. If anybody wants to touch on that question, I think it's a very powerful one. I actually think, Caroline, you might be best placed to answer that one, <laughs> given your, your focus. No, no, no. You guys are on, 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 on the panel today. <laughs> <laughs> but please, I know you work with Indigenous Voices, so if you have particular comments on that, I think you would be very, really happy to hear them. I really wanted to hear another voice, but OK, OK. How do, we... do you know, I think it's important for Indigenous peoples to speak up for themselves. Um, I think it's very important for people of the Global North to amplify the voices of the Global South right now. Um, I think in particular, those who live very close to the land. And it's not just indigenous peoples, it's also local and traditional peoples, coastal communities, fishermen, um, mm. but in particular, indigenous peoples, not just in the Western hemisphere, I know people have this concept of indigenous peoples coming from the Western hemisphere, but indigenous peoples are all over the world. So in Russia, right, and in Ukraine right now, they are suffering with this war. Uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, they are, dealing with everything that we've been talking about today. Um, in, in Africa, there's a fantastic um, spokesperson, Hindu Ibrahim from Chad, who is a cartographer. Uh, she had the most beautiful TED talk where she talks about, you know, instead of going on her weather app to check out her weather, she's gonna talk to her grandmother who can figure out, is it going to rain today? And not only is it going to rain today, is it going to rain for the rest of the year? Um, how are the crops going to be doing? And this is just from a deep understanding of the earth. And Professor Gobin, as you were saying, we have a deep understanding of the ocean and, and Judge Slade was agreeing with that. We have a deep understanding of the ocean on these tiny, on our small island states and large ocean states. Indigenous peoples have a deep connection to the earth because it has been an, a knowledge, a scientific knowledge trial and error that has been honed not just for centuries but for millennia i think we need to remember that and, and raise that but i'm speaking too much this is about you guys so that's good <laughs> anybody wants to add to that i'm going to look for another question i'm just going to quickly add to that um caroline just to say that i'm really pleased to say that in all of our scientific studies that we do now we always include the indigenous peoples, you know, that, and I'm really glad that that has become very, um, you know, really part and parcel of understanding and appreciate because like you, um, I know it, it, well, as you know, in Trinidad, yes, your grandparents always know what's when the hurricane is coming and when the earthquake is coming as well, so. <laughs> Absolutely, my grandmother was actually part indigenous and she has passed down her love of plants to us so it's, it's incredible to see, but here is a beautiful question. Um, oh gosh, I lost it again. Um, I, th I think I, th I, was, I was just wondering whether um, Ambassador Manuri wanted to add to that one. Uh, yes, I, I think that's a, that's a very good one. Um, I, I believe the, well, our, our uh, session is um, um, Island holding the world to account, but uh, as you know, islands uh, physically, yes, we, we are islands from uh, Pacific, Caribbean. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, sh we should, uh, I think at the next step, um, expand the, the concept of islands to um, uh, small uh, communities in, in bigger landmass. Say, for example, in South America, in Africa, or in, um, uh, West Pap in countries like West Papua. But, uh, small communities, there are islands uh, there. They, they do understand the, uh, the, the environment. Uh, they need that uh, environment and biodiversity to make their own life. So I, I believe that while we, well, our, we are islands um, in terms of landmass, but as, at the same time, I think we should also expand to uh, island as small communities in bigger island, in bigger landmass. So I, I think that that would also uh, would, would be um, I, I guess 
uh, as uh, I believe uh, um, uh, Judge Slade was was mentioning, we should we should give more 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 work to Joshua to, to also include those um, uh, islands uh, island communities in in bigger land masses. I think that's a very like issue um, because they face the same isolation, the same. Um, um, problems of, 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 of being almost marooned in their locations, you know, so it, it might not be surrounded by water, but you're an island in the landmass. It's, it's so true. Well, do you know, I'm going to take that moment to say thank you. I think we are running out of time here, but I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to all the panelists, to Judge Slade, to Professor Gobin, and of course to Ambassador George. Thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful panel. And Jojo Meta, the inspiration and the powerhouse behind Stop Ecocide, you are doing fantastic work. We just want to thank you from small islands, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for all the hard work that you're doing.